As was said on Sunday, and has been said many times, we have to become divine scientists, divine physicists, divine alchemists, and also we have to become divine psychologists. And in our exploration of the place that it said we arrive at when we no longer need to try, with story, we've already looked at the science, the physics, and the chemistry. And now, with story, we're looking at the divine psychology of the place that it said that we arrive at when we no longer need to try. And there's another old story that again begins with those words in a time long ago, in a place far away. There was a small village. A road had been built which bypassed the hamlet, so it languished. Travellers did not come that way anymore, or very few. There were very few people who came to ply their trade, or any such, not any longer being on a main road. So there was an air of sadness and dejectedness amongst the populace of that small place. So it so happened that the celestial beings looking down saw this dark cloud resting above this small village. And so it was said, is there anyone willing to go and help these people? And one of the celestial beings said, I will go. So, not long after, just as the day was coming to an end, a strange-looking being appeared on the road leading to the village. He was a strange-looking character, having purple satin trousers, a green velvet jacket, wearing little slippers that had barrels on the end and because they turned up at the toes. So when he came into town and people noticed him, they were very taken aback. They'd never had such a strange looking being come into their town before. And at first they were a little intrigued, but uh, in the particular mood they were in, they immediately became suspicious and it happened that the mayor was in town at that time and so he marched up to the stranger and said, who are you? And the stranger said, oh, I'm just a traveller on the road, I go from place to place to meet people. And so people started to go about their business. Uh, then the day was coming to an end. The sun was going down and the storekeepers were closing up their shops and the women were taking their children back to their homes to prepare the evening meal. And uh, the, the old mayor was still hanging about and, and he disgruntled as he would. He said, I don't know what you want to come to this town for. There's nothing, nothing to bring you here. We've got nothing to offer you at all. And the stranger said, but, but look at this magnificent tree. There was in the middle of the town square, there was this great majestic tree. And the stranger said, listen, listen to the birds. Listen to this, oh, that, and then one of the other people standing by, they're just Ned screeching birds, who wants to listen to them. And the stranger said, but look, all of your townspeople would be able to fit under this tree, under its shade. 
but people didn't take any notice of it and the mayor himself wasn't very impressed. So pretty soon the town square was all but empty and the stranger who'd come into town sat under the huge tree and as the people dispersed he got up and he started to wander down the streets that led off the square, uh, not, not looking um, particularly uh, to, to peep on people, but uh, viewing through the windows when the candles were lit, but again there was that dejectedness with the people and he could hear the comments of some, like the storekeeper, who, who, the sadness in his voice said, I only had three customers today. And, and the woman who was complaining of her child and so forth, he listened to the woes of the people as they shared them around their dinner table. But after some while, all the candles in the windows went out and the town was quiet. So the stranger went back to sit under the tree and he took out from a little satchel he had a flute and he began to play on this flute a melancholy tune, a sad sound. And it seemed that in the houses around the town as people went off to sleep, they sighed in, as, this, as the weight of their problems weighed on them as they went into slumber. And the stranger continued to play on his flute, this sound, sad and melancholy tune, and suddenly he went quiet. And all was quiet and still for a while, when suddenly, putting the flute to his lips again, he blew a loud and strident sound, which pierced into the windows and under the doors of every house in that town, and woke everybody up with a start. Up in their beds they sat, and putting on their clothes, they all trooped out into the town square. What was going on here? What was it and why were we woken up like this? So as they all gathered around, there the stranger stood and he quietly said to them, give me your woes, give me your troubles, give me your burdens. And suddenly there under the tree was a pile of rubble. Each of the beings unloading the pains that they had, taking different Form. So at the feet of the being, under the tree, there was a pile of rubble. And then the stranger took up one of the pieces of the rubble, a piece of stone, and he looked at the mare. It was the mare's stone. And he said to the mayor, Look, this is your responsibility. This is the pain of the responsibility you have as you pace every night, troubled by not being able to bring well-being to your people in your town. And then he squeezed the piece of stone in his hand. And when he opened his hand, there was a beautiful diamond with a piece of string. So he put it up 
on the tree and people looked in wonder. And then he took another piece of slate and he turned to one of the storekeepers and he said, this is the pain of you not being able to provide enough food for your family day after day. The sorrow you feel in your heart as you look at the tears and the thin faces of your children. And he squeezed it and opened it up and there was a beautiful emerald and he hung it on the tree. And on and on he went, taking each piece of rubble and naming the trouble that had he set this person, changing it into a jewel, hanging it on the tree. And then an old woman, an old woman said, This is this is my this is my piece of wood, tell me what is my ailment. And the stranger said, This is your loneliness. Since you lost your husband and your children have grown and you have no one the weight of your loneliness. And he squeezed it. And it came out a beautiful ruby. He said, you see, in your heart you have so much love. There's so many children here who need to be embraced and loved. What a grandmother you are. And he hung the string with the ruby on the tree. And people began to wonder, the wife of the man whose emerald had been put up there, sidled over and held his hand. A little child, seeing the sadness of the old woman, went over and climbed under her apron as she enfolded them. Everyone began to listen to everyone else, and looking up at the tree, wondered at the jewels that their sorrow, their sadness, and their burdens really were. And then the stranger took his flute and blew a few more sounds, trilling now, softer, lighter. And he said, now it's time for you to rest and sleep. Go back to your houses. Mm -hmm and sleep. And the crowd dispersed and went back to their homes. And as they lay their heads down on the pillow, the feeling of lightness was there. The sighs were no longer weighted with the burden of sadness and woe. The stranger went back to his tree and sat until the morning came. The mayor awoke. The sun was shining and he looked out the window and seemingly for the first time saw the brightness that the sun had revealed, the dew on the grass the trees waving in the breeze. But as he slipped his feet into his slippers, he felt something hard in the toe. And when he looked, he took out the diamond that had been on the tree and saw that the sun was showing its facets, revealing them to him and every other person in that town found their gem and began to recognize the qualities, what truly comes and is wrought out of burdens and sadness and sorrow and loss. Having done his work, the stranger quietly left the town and returned from whence he came.
divine psychology. When we now look at this place, this place where the physics of it has shown us that it's being present. You could say the science of it is listening. The chemistry of it is the loss of a sense of self and separation in our meetings with the people and experiences of life. And the divine psychology what does this story tell us, reveal to us about this place that we arrive at when we no longer need to try the energy to do being brought to an intense presence, stillness, awareness, listening. And what's there? What's behind this awareness and this stillness and this presence? What does this story reveal to us about our relationship with life now when we no longer need to try. What does this story bespeak to you? Presence. Listening. Witness. What is it doing? What does this story tell us? 